September 1st, 1939 is when we essentially say that the Second World War began. Um, this is certainly true for um, the European allies. Um, technically speaking, the Second World War begins in 1937 when uh, China and Japan go to, go, go to war. Um, but 1939, certainly for Europeans, September 1st, uh, for the first time, Hitler doesn't just annex a country or, or kind of, um, you know, subvert its independence as he did with Czechoslovakia. Uh, this is a straight out uh, invasion of Poland, September 1st, 1939. Uh, the Germans strike from Czechoslovakia, which of course is under German control, from Germany, and from East Prussia. It's a surprise blitzkrieg um, in, in invasion. And Hitler already has laid out the agenda prior to the invasion um, to his high command. Um, Hitler essentially says, that the military will be authorized to kill, quote, without pity or mercy, all men, women, and children of Polish descent and language. Uh, only in this way can we obtain the living space we need, Lebensraum. So essentially, Hitler just gives the authority to kill all Poles whenever you think you need to do it. Um, it's, it's the beginning of the racial war. And, 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 and the war in the East, of course, is, is going to be waged in a radically different way than the way the Nazis are going to wage the war in, 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 in the West. Um, when the Nazis go into uh, Denmark, when they go into Holland, the Netherlands, Belgium, France, um, uh, they will treat those peoples in um, certainly in the brutal way, but not in a kind of genocidal way that they will treat Eastern European peoples. Um, and, and, and that, of course, is a matter, again, of, of, of racial war. So Poland, of course, is, is going to be brutally suppressed in this invasion. Uh, by September 9th, um, the Germans uh, have fought not very far into Poland, as you can see from this map. In, in, in fact, Poland does not fall as easily as, as, as often propaganda uh, suggests. Uh, the Poles are waiting for the British and the French to deploy in Poland to help them. Uh, they're holding off the Germans. By September 9th, in the first nine days of the war, the Germans have captured no major Polish city except for Krakow, which is a medieval historic city. And so the Poles leave it as an open city because they don't want it destroyed as a historic, as a historic city. And, and, and so otherwise, the Poles are holding the Germans off. It's, it's not as um, as I say, it's not as an easy defeat of, of, of um, Poland as, as we often uh, think. The, you know, to a certain extent, Blitzkrieg is a, is a myth. The Poles are holding off the Germans waiting for the British and French to come. And of course, they don't, essentially. And so it becomes convenient politically as well for the, both the French and the British to exaggerate the power of the Blitzkrieg, its kind of indefensibility, uh, to cover up their own failure to deploy as promised to Poland. So by September 17, 17 days into the war, the Germans have only advanced this far. The Poles are still holding out, waiting for the Allies to arrive. War, Warsaw, the capital, has not fallen. Um, and of course, September 17 is where everything changes from Poland. On September 17, as the um, Hitler-Stalin um, 
Vietnam Aggression Treaty that they made in August, by the terms of that treaty, the Russians now come in to take their half of Poland. And so September 17th, the Russians pour into Poland, and that now is the beginning of the end of the Polish government. Um, and even so, unlike the French, the Polish government never surrenders. The Polish government uh, leaves Poland and reestablishes itself in uh, London, and, and they'll become the exiled Polish uh, government, unlike the French who turn turncoats and make a deal with the Nazis, you know, the Vichy French, the Poles uh, fight on. But once the Soviets come in, there's no hope militarily for the Poles to, to um, hang on. And how so are, October, yes, I oh, have a question. How, how are like the Polish able to retreat? Like, where did they retreat from? Like, the UK's a long ways away. Well, um, how they managed to escape? Well, some Poles um, escape um, into the Russian side. And, and, and so the Russians, of course, uh, treat the Poles less genocidally. And of course, remember once uh, Germany attacks Russia, all those Poles who were um, in, uh, as Russian POWs, the ones that survived the cotton massacre, because of course the Russians massacre the Polish core, um, uh, the Polish officer corps, those Poles are now let go by the Russians and they end up going to Iran and then the British Eighth Army in North Africa and end up fighting their way up through Italy. Um, the Polish Navy and their submarines sail to England. Uh, the uh, Polish Air Force, the pilots fly their planes to England um and and uh so a lot of polish pilots and 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 the poles the polish air force was buying its aircraft from the british so all these uh polish air force hurricanes uh hurricane fighter planes are flown by the poles to to england um you know the british had to bomb the french navy because the French Navy refused once France surrendered, um, was going to allow its Navy um, to become part of the German Nazi Navy. Uh, the Poles absolutely did not do that. Um, and, and, and so you had a huge sector of the Polish military that once everything went bad, just, just did not surrender to the Germans. They just escaped to England that way. Um, as far as infantry goes, um, most of them, as I say, made their way as first POWs through Russia. Okay, thank you. So um, October 6th, uh, it's the end. Warsaw falls and uh, the Nazis now march into Warsaw. And um, you can take a look at the city of Paris and the city of Warsaw just to see what Nazi occupation left behind. This is um, the Prudential building in Warsaw, the highest building in Warsaw. When the Germans leave in 1944, this is the condition they leave um, the city. They just completely destroy this, this once beautiful ancient uh, medieval city. It's leveled by the Nazis. This is not bombing that you're looking at. This is Nazis um, essentially reducing the city during the famous um, Warsaw Revolt. This is not the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which took place in 1943. This is the August, September 1944 Warsaw Revolt, when all the people of Warsaw rise up against the, the, the Germans. And um, we estimate about a quarter million Poles are killed in this, in this uprising. Nothing is left of Warsaw by the Nazis. Poland no longer exists as a country. Uh, the Soviet Union now takes its half of Poland and it's incorporated into um, Soviet uh, 
state. And of course, you got to remember Poland, of course, was part of Imperial Russia through the 19th century by virtue of conquest. So um, the Russians essentially feel they're taking back what was theirs anyway. But um, that part of Poland will be incorporated into the Soviet Union <coughs> and remains today part of Belarus. After the Second World War, um, those parts of Poland will not be returned to Poland. Instead, um, the Allies will take a piece of Germany and give it to Poland, um, and, and that, those define the borders of Poland today, uh, the so-called Corzon line on the eastern uh, border of Poland is, is where Poland will be redivided again. Poland has been divided and redivided and partitioned so many times, including in the Yalta agreements of 1944. But Poland now ceases to exist as an independent nation. Um, as I say, the, the Soviet Union takes, takes back its peace, while the Germans eliminate the nation of Poland. Uh, Warteline, West Prussia, and East, well, East Prussia was always part of Germany, but um, West Prussia, Danzig, and Warteline become these special, uh, become Gauls inside of Germany. Warteland is, is a kind of a special governorship uh, on its way to becoming a Gaul. And the government general becomes this kind of special territory under rule of a governor general, Nazi governor general. And, and, and the purpose of the governor general, it's going to be a kind of a reservation for people that the Nazis don't want. Uh, a kind of killing ground. And of course, it's in the government general that the annihilation camps in Operation Reinhardt um, will take place. It's kind of a kingdom of death. Hans Frank, uh, one of the leading lawyers in Nazi Germany, the head of the German uh, Bar Association, I think he was a Reichsleiter for law, uh, Hans Frank is appointed as the governor of the government general. <clears throat> and Hans Frank, of course, will be one of the 20 Nuremberg defendants for what he will do in, 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 in Poland. A lot happens on his watch. He'll be nicknamed um, Koning Frank, um, King Frank, because he has so much power in the government general. He'll establish himself, the capital um, uh, will be um, moved to uh, Krakow. He'll establish himself in this uh, Renaissance era uh, summer villa. And um, in the city of Krakow, he establishes himself in the castle. And he'll rule um, this vast staff of SS and Nazi police and military um, of, of, of officials, although um, he's going to come into conflict very quickly with who really is in charge, and that's Heinrich Himmler. Um, even though nominally the police report to Hans Frank, often they kind of skip over him and report directly to Heydrich and, and, and Himmler, and, and that's going to be a problem. So as I say, um, Hans Frank will be put to death um, at, at Nuremberg. He's one of the key defendants. And everything he does in Poland, uh, as I say, um, you can find in the testimony in that Blue Series, he's one of the Blue Series defendants. Um, Heydrich is essentially in, in, in charge. Heydrich immediately orders uh, that Jews be confined in, in, in ghettos. Um, Heydrich also uh, dispatches the first Einsatzgruppen. Um, Einsatzgruppen are battalion-sized mobile killing units. Uh, they're divided into smaller 
uh, platoons uh, or Einsatz commandos. Einsatz uh, means special task, so special task groups, special task commandos. Uh, and and uh, these fan out through Europe and, and their major objective is to immediately uh, pacify the Polish population. They're not targeting Jews in Poland. Uh, the Einsatzgruppen are um, actually targeting uh, Poles. And so they begin to round up uh, anybody in Poland who they think might be a, a potential resistance uh, fighter or someone who can organize resistance. Um, the first people, in fact, who the Einsatzgruppen will shoot will be all Polish Boy Scouts between the ages of 12 and 16. Um, all the Boy Scouts will be immediately rounded up because they fear that they'll be easily formed into resistance groups and, and, and they're immediately shot. Uh, priests as well, Catholic priests, um, as you know, um, uh, the Pope Wojtyla, John Paul II, uh, barely escaped with his life. He was growing up in Poland during this time. Um, the Nazis are, are shooting priests as, of course, Catholic priests can rally a, a populist and represent their um, kind of the ethnicity of Poland. You know, Catholicism, of course, is very much a Polish identity. Um, and, and in fact, the Poles, despite the fact that they were partitioned uh, by the Russians and the Prussians, essentially through the Catholic Church, that um, kind of Polish nationalist aspirations and identity remained. Um, they shoot approximately 45% uh, of all Polish physicians and dentists, 57% of Polish attorneys are murdered, 15% of school teachers, 40% of all the professors, 30% of all um, kind of technicians, electricians, uh, skilled labor, and 18% um, of the Polish clergy are executed. Up until 1942, 90% uh, of inmates in German concentration camps are Polish. Uh, so the, the Poles are being mass arrested as, as, as well. The intention essentially is, is to eliminate the existence of um, a, 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 a Polish people. And, and, and so um, these massacres of Poles, uh, eventually they will kill about two and a half million non-Jewish uh, Poles between 1939 and 1945. And, and probably another 500,000 uh, die uh, directly in war-related ways, uh, you know, caught in crossfire, uh, bombing, and, and, and so forth. So we're talking about approximately 3 million uh, Poles dying under the German occupation. Uh, and, and then you have um, roughly another two and a half million to three million uh, Polish Jews as well. So we're talking about five to five and a half million Polish citizens, Jewish and Catholics, being uh, murdered by, by, by the Nazis. So Poland suffers uh, the highest civilian murder rate um, of all the countries per capita. There'll be more Russians murdered than 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 Poles, but um, per capita, as they say, Poland is 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 a is a smaller uh, country. It's hard to estimate again Polish Jewish death um, again because of kind of the, the, the that border. Um, those Jews that ended up in uh, the Soviet zone of Poland. Many of them managed to survive if they um, managed to get out of Poland and move further east 
into Russia before the Germans, of course, go to war with Russia. Those that don't, of course, end up eventually uh, being killed by, by, by the Germans. The military, of course, is quite shocked by these executions, and uh, there's quite a debate in the military. Um, in fact, German soldiers caught participating in, in, in some of these massacres of Poles are actually court-martialed by the German military. And the German military uh, um, circulates orders, ordering soldiers not to get involved in what is the racial cleansing of Poland, that there are other organs of the state. Um, and and, 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 and um, certainly the Nazis intervene in the court martials of those soldiers who um, end up being uh, charged in some of these uh, massacres for participating in them without being given orders to do so. Um, and of course, none of that is going to be a problem once the Nazis in June of 1941 invade Russia. By then, um, the German army and the police SS are going to be working in, in perfect uh, partnership. Many of these massacres are public. They're intended as a message to the Polish citizens. Um, school children are brought to these executions so that they can witness them and, and learn what it means to oppose the German occupation. And this will be, as I say, Nazi policy throughout Eastern Europe, these kinds of massive public executions and hangings as, as, as a message. I think we've seen these photographs in my early lecture. These are all taken um, in the Eastern zones from Poland to Russia to Yugoslavia. This is ethnic cleansing. Population, of course, is immediately enslaved as well. Um, their only function, uh, if they're allowed to live, is to produce food. If they don't produce food enough, um, of course, they're punished and whipped. And entire villages end up being deported uh, to Germany as slaves. Any resistance is immediately punished by death, public hangings. And as I say, this is not only in Poland in 1939, this will be throughout uh, Yugoslavia as well, and uh, of course into Russia through 1941, right, right to the end, this, this kind of freeing of land so the Germans can be settled on it. This is Leben's realm you're looking at. Poles are required to wear this kind of um, triangle in the way Jews will be later. Uh, Poles are marked before Jews are with a P. This is for uh, Polish slaves who um, end up working in, in Germany. They're very quickly identified. There's a different uh, legal system for them. Any kind of offense they may commit in Germany, uh, immediately it's the death penalty. Here you can see a, a, a Polish slave with that P sewn to her. Um, a lot of Polish girls and uh, women um, are, are sent to work on uh, German farms and German households as servants. Uh, you know, you need a servant or you need a nanny. You can get a cheap slave uh, from uh, the SS. You can rent a slave. And, and of course, in Poland, you have a very large Orthodox 
uh, community. So for the first time, as Germans are marching into Poland, they're now coming into contact with those um, movie Jews, if, if you want to put it that way, that they've been seeing in German propaganda films, in, in their textbooks, um, that were not very predominant in Germany itself. Remember, the Jews of Germany were relatively assimilated and, and, and you know, what we would describe as reformed liberal uh, Jews. Uh, here in Poland, uh, they now begin to encounter the stereotypical Jews that Nazi propaganda has been preparing um, Germans for over, a, you know, for a decade now, almost a decade. And so these first encounters with German troops, um, you know, they're looking at um, these Jews is kind of a, an exotic species of intermensch that they've only seen, as I say, in magazines and in, in, in movies, and now they're encountering them. And of course, um, they immediately, um, these kinds of forms of abuse uh, and humiliation and degradation begin to uh, occur. There are, um, again, small massacres of, of, of Poles, but, oh, I'm sorry, of Jews, uh, but it's not systemic. Um, and, and again, uh, you know, there's an incident where a German military unit executes some Jews and, and those soldiers are court-martialed uh, for that. So it's not yet official policy, these abuses. Um, the local population as well, of course, you know, there is, remember, a tradition of anti-Semitism in Polish, uh, in the Polish um, um, uh, Catholic populace. And, and, and so the Germans will, of course, encourage locals as well to turn against Jews. Uh, you know, as Germans are murdering Poles, they're inspiring other Poles that they don't murder to murder Jews. And that's, again, typical of German occupational policy. They'll do that in Yugoslavia, where Germans will encourage Croats to kill Serbs or, or uh, you know, Bosnian Herzegovian um, Muslims in, in Bosnia to kill, again, Serbs. So that kind of ethnic divisions are further encouraged by the Germans. Ukrainians uh, to kill Jews in, in, in those territories and 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 so forth. It, it is part of German policy to, uh, to incite local population into anti-Semitic acts. This is the incident that I'm describing to you in Konskik on September 12th. The war was still on. The Germans still hadn't conquered Poland where they massacre um, a number of, 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 of Jews. So the government general essentially is going to become this dumping ground um, for, for Jews and Poles. What happens, of course, is this kind of a three-way migration. Uh, Heydrich will um, order, first of all, all Poles living in what are German parts of Poland will have to leave their homes and move to the government general. Uh, Jews living in the countryside will be required to leave their homes and move into ghettos in the big cities of, of, of the government general, Warsaw, Lublin, Krakow, uh, Lodz, um, while um, ethnic Germans will be brought some from Russia, once the Germans invade Russia, there are a lot of ethnic Germans there, some from Germany, and they will settle into the Polish homes with the idea of um, those parts of Poland that are now incorporated in Germany just becoming Germanized and as German as Munich or, 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 or Berlin, while the government general becomes this killing ground where everybody who has been deported from other parts of Poland 
and, 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 and Jews being deported from everywhere in Europe are ending up in the government general, where, you know, which is why I describe it kind of as a kingdom of death. Hydra, as they say, is in charge. And so the ghetto uh, is now revived, this ancient medieval concept. Uh, as I say, uh, all Jews living in the country are ordered immediately to take what they can carry and they're walled in in a number of uh, dense, crowded city uh, neighborhoods. Access is controlled by the Nazi SD, the Zippo, the Sicherheitspolizei, the SD and the Gestapo. Uh, and they become kind of these self-administrating, self-sustaining communities. Um, the Judenrat, the, the, the uh, Jewish elders are uh, prominent Jewish members of the community are selected by the Nazis and put in charge of organizing these ghettos. Um, again, uh, like in the concentration camp, Nazis don't like to go inside the ghetto itself. They just man the ghetto walls. They expect Jews to self-administrate these, these, these ghettos. And uh, some are better at it. Some are uh, perhaps uh, worse. You're looking, for example, um, here at um, uh, Adam Chernikov, who becomes the elder of the Warsaw ghetto, the biggest ghetto in, in, in Poland. Um, you can see who really is in charge, the guy uh, just to the right of him. You can see an SS officer there, or, or a, certainly a, a, a SS a government official, I'm not quite sure if he's an SS officer or a Nazi government administrator in Poland. Um, your luck depending uh, uh, on survival depends really on the quality of um, the Jewish elders. Um, Chernyakov is uh, sets up these orphanages, schooling, uh, medical facilities, sets up a kind of a, a self-sustaining support system in, 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 in Warsaw. Eventually, the Nazis will start ordering the uh, Judenrats to deport people, deliver Jews for labor. Uh, and so, you know, tomorrow you have to give us 2,000 citizens for labor, have them assemble at the railway station. Uh, and, 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 and so it becomes up to the Jewish elders to select who lives and dies. Um, and, and many, of course, at first don't realize that these stories about uh, people being deported to labor camps, actually, they're being deported to, de to gas chambers, being killed. And, and, and when Charnyakov realizes that these lists of people that he selects are actually being um, murdered, he commits suicide rather than uh, participate in, in another uh, killing. He leaves behind diaries, in fact, that we have, have today as, as, as well. Other um, Jewish leaders sometimes are more corrupt. Uh, Mordecai Haim Rumkowski, for example, the, the silver head, silver headed individual right there. You can see he's meeting with, with Himmler sitting in the car. You can tell it's Himmler's car, SS1 on the license plate. That's, that's, that's him. Uh, uh, Rumkowski wears uh, German army boots. He is very corrupt. He'll put you on the list um, to be deported if you don't pay him or his friends bribes. He prints his own money. He puts his face on the postage stamps. Um, essentially, he's a little Nazi. And, and of course, it doesn't save him. In the end, when they liquidate the lodge ghetto, uh, Rumkowski will be the last to go into the gas chamber. He'll be uh, killed by, by the Germans. But Rumkowski is essentially re remembered as this kind of corrupt Jewish elder that, that helped to kill essentially his own uh, people.
There is a, uh, inside the ghettos, there's a Jewish police that operate. They have their own transport system. Um, and Jewish police, of course, are the most hated uh, because they're the ones when, when, you know, when the elders are told, get us 2,000 people um, to the railway station, it's the Jewish police that have to round them up. And so when, uh, for example, the Warsaw Ghetto revolts, it's the Jewish police who are the first ones to be killed by, uh, by the rebels. They're particularly hated. The plan, essentially the purpose of these ghettos initially when they're formed in Poland was again uh, Jews being gathered for the eventual deportation to Madagascar under the Madagascar plan. And, and of course we know um, that's not going to happen once May 1940 uh, France falls, Madagascar is going to be off, um, you know, off the agenda. Wait, why did that not work out with Madagascar? What did France do? It didn't work out because Madagascar is a French colony. And, and, and so um, the Germans expected that it would take them a year to defeat France in a war, not realizing that the French would surrender within six weeks uh, and that the French will become allies of Nazi Germany. Uh, and so as a reward for the French becoming Nazi allies, the French are allowed to keep their the colonies. And so they would not, the Germans would not be able to use Madagascar unless the French gave them permission. All right. Um, nor was it going to be practical now. Uh, in, in the middle of the war, how do you transport, for example, um, you know, two and a half million Polish Jews to Madagascar in the middle of, of, of the war. How's that going to work? How's that even going to work in peacetime? And, and, and so eventually the Madagascar plan just fades away. But the, the kind of the coup de grace that ends the Madagascar plan is um, the issue of, of it not, no longer being available under the scenario that you know, the Nazis were thinking, once we conquer France, we can do whatever we want with its colonies. You know, the French are allowed to keep, you know, Algeria, North Africa. For those of you who saw the movie, um, Casablanca, right? There, there's a German officer and, and then there's a French officer. Why, why is the French officer working with the Germans in Casablanca in Morocco, right? Because the French were allowed to keep uh, Morocco. In fact, when the Americans land in North Africa um, and the British land in North Africa to fight the Africa Corps, they have to fight their way through the French army. Everybody forgets that, right? The French army is defending the Africa Corps at the beaches of North Africa. Uh, you know, um, it's, it's, it's just one of those twists in history that France kind of becomes our ally very late in the war. You know, once you have American boots on the ground and Canadian boots on D-Day, suddenly all the French are, oh, you know, we've always hated the Nazis. We've always been, um, we've always believed in De Gaulle and so forth, which is nonsense. You know? The French were divided. Um, a lot of them liked Nazi ideology. A lot of them hated Jews, hated communists, hated labor unions, and, and uh, collaborated with the Nazis. The French were one of the, the largest collaborationist states in the Second World War. Um, so, so this kind of, as I say, cancels the Madagascar plan. Uh, very difficult to survive in the ghettos, of course, um, especially if you uh, come from a rural environment and you find yourself uh, suddenly in this urban ghetto. Um, you know, this woman here obviously is surviving by just selling um, armbands that Jews are required to wear now to identify themselves. Lots of homelessness, overcrowding, and there'll come a point where uh, Nazi administrators will also seal the ghettos. In other words, for a while, 
the ghettos are functioning and surviving because Jews in the ghettos can trade with non-Jews outside the ghetto. So there's a kind of a, a, a flow of goods and services across ghetto walls. Eventually, the Nazis seal the ghettos completely. Nothing comes in, nothing goes out. And of course, starvation breaks out in, in these ghettos. Some people are better set up to survive. Others are, 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 are not. Um, and, and, you know, one of the remarkable things about this is, um, and, and this speaks again to the functionalist, intentionalist argument that I'll get into later in lecture or in the recorded lecture I'll post, depending upon how we go. Um, as Jews are about a month away, for example, in Warsaw from completely dying out from starvation and disease, the German administration makes the decision to save them and they bring in relief into the ghetto. And, and this is despite the fact that ghetto administrators are, are giving warnings that, you know, if something isn't done in, in the next four weeks, everybody's going to die in the ghetto of, of natural causes. It'll become one big cemetery. And some of the Nazi ghetto advisors kind of shrug their shoulders and go, yeah, so what? Uh, and higher administrators in the Nazi occupational uh, organization make the decision that the ghettos need to be saved, that the people in the ghettos need to be saved for future labor purposes, which is used as evidence for historians that in fact they're still as late as even 19 the the the, the winter of 1941 and the spring of 1941 that the decision to exterminate the Jews had not yet been made because otherwise you know if they had decided they were going to kill the Jews why not let those four weeks go by and everybody will be dead if that was the intention of uh, the Nazi state. So clearly the final solution that late in the game um, had not been yet adopted or identified as the national policy towards, uh, towards the Jews. The Nazis also now start deporting Western European Jews into those ghettos. Uh, so for example, the Jews in Amsterdam are now given the order to pack up and leave. Jews in France are being packed off to these ghettos as, as well. And their survival is, is going to be even less of a chance. Um, for those of you who might've traveled in Eastern Europe, you know, on the bus or the train, you know, there's different kind of cultural um, values or habits. Uh, you, you know, people in Western Europe tend to line up. People in Eastern Europe, uh, since, you know, since the beginning, um, it's a more of a doggy dog world. There are no lineups. You kind of, whoever can squeeze through first and elbow their way in gets in. Um, and, and, and so when you have kind of um, Eastern European Jews getting their first, getting, um, you know, the best apartments, the best jobs, the best uh, rations and so forth, you now have this second wave of kind of very polite Western um, Jews from, you know, Amsterdam, Belgium, France arriving. They're just not going to have a chance. I mean, Eastern European Jews are barely surviving the ghettos. What chance will will um, these Western Jews have? You know, these are people who are arriving at a ghetto deportation in a suit and tie, um, or, or 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 sunglasses, as 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 you see that woman in the back. They think they're just going to live 
in a different place and, and work. Um, they don't realize the horrific conditions of the ghetto into which they're, they're, they're going to get uh, deported. And, and, and of course, eventually, as the ghettos are liquidated, they're then redeported again um, into death camps, those that manage to survive um, the ghetto. And, and so um, this is the fate that will befall now German, German Jews uh, beginning in uh, September, October of 1941. Until that date, German Jews remained living in Germany. Uh, they were not living in ghettos, although um, they were living in kind of designated areas where they would be allowed to have an apartment. Um, Hitler gives the order in, uh, as I say, in September 1941, the, the Jews of Germany are going to be deported as well. And uh, some of them will be deported into those ghettos. Some of them will be deported directly to death camps as they start going up. But um, now the murder in the fall of 1941 of all Jews of Europe begins with the deportation of German Jews now out, out, out of Germany. And again, a separate topic. So all that stuff the German kids were seeing in their textbooks uh, now begins to bear its poison fruit. They're actually going to see uh, German Jews now being, being deported. But that's how long it takes um, from January of 1933 when Hitler becomes chancellor um, till September, October of 1941 is when the German Jews finally will uh, be subject to, to deportation. So it takes the Nazi bureaucracy quite a while to ramp up this, this killing process. And once it begins, um, it's, it's going to happen very quickly. In fact, um, in October of 1941, 80% of the Jews that will die in the Holocaust are still alive. Uh, so we're talking about 80% of 6 million uh, deaths occurring after uh, October of 1941. So it happens quickly. It happens in a massive scale and, and, and um, it happens almost unexpectedly. You know, it's a very slow uh, buildup. Okay, um, it's 2.50. Let me give you a, a five minute break if you need one. And um, I'll continue in uh, two, at 2.55.
All right, welcome back, everyone. So let's start looking um, deeper into the process of, of the final solution and, and, and how it worked. Uh, again, um, if we go by Raoul Hilberg's four stages of, of, of the Holocaust, um, we saw in the last lecture uh, how the Nazis defined Jews. Uh, and we saw to some extent um, how they were expropriated of their uh, ability to practice their professions, to earn a living, of their civil rights, and eventually their uh, property, complete expropriation. And, and um, we've talked as well about the deportation and, and the concentration into uh, ghettos as, as well. And, and later we'll see into death camps. Uh, and, and what's left out before we actually look at the extermination, of course, is this question that I find is, is often, um, certainly in my classroom lectures, the one that's put to me most often, well, you know, how did they know who's a Jew? If, if, if Jews were assimilated, uh, if um, it's absolute nonsense that you could recognize who's a Jew by their physical uh, features alone. How did they know who's a Jew? And, and, and this is um, a, a, a complex issue that I'll try to explain here in, in, in how exactly this process worked. And, and part of it, of course, is the old school uh, nature of European administration and, and record keeping. Um, uh, you know, certainly uh, Prussia kept records going back to um, the 1700s. It, uh, you know, if I had to prove my ancestry going back to 1750, I don't know where I would, would even start uh, looking. Um, you know, I'm originally, my family's from Russia. Uh, you know, nothing survived in, in the Russian records, not, not even, um, you know, to the 1930s, barely anything has, let alone 1750. That's not the case in, 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 in uh, Germany. Um, so, Rao Hilberg, when he looks at this, this, this question, begins to see that there's already certain anti-Semitic provisions that are introduced by the Weimar Republic. Uh, for example, there's a draft for a law in the Weimar Republic to introduce um, a law that will prohibit Jews from changing their name in a way that um, would perhaps conceal their Jewish identity. Um, and, and, and so that's before the Nazis came uh, to power. There is this kind of, again, concern that uh, people are identifiable in, 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 in Germany, in pre-Nazi Germany. So we know what the definitions are, we know how the expropriations and deportations went, but um, what about the identification? So one of the greatest sources of data for the Nazi government was of course the census. Um, Prussia has held a census every five years since 1816, Germany since 1871. Uh, there was an interruption during the First World War, um, and, and then the Weimar census begins again in 1925. 
they collect, of course, uh, for, you know, for those of you who, who've done the Canadian version of the census, they collect all sorts of social uh, data in it. Um, Hitler, when he takes power, immediately holds his first census in June of 1933. So um, Hitler immediately takes stock of, of the population. He deploys approximately 500,000, half a million census takers, Nazi party officials, assessmen, stormtroopers, uh, war veterans, unemployed students, and, and, and so forth. Um, the 1933 census is tuned to collect data on uh, females, uh, particularly because the Nazi party is concerned about fertility. And, and so date of marriage, number of children, uh, nature of employment, and, and, and so forth. Um, that's essentially what shapes the 1933 uh, census um, of fertility issues. And, and again, I've talked all, all, all this about before, um, that census data was supposed to be used by the Nazis to establish tax incentives um, to encourage uh, the birth rate, and, and it's a failure. Uh, the Third Reich will never surpass the birth rate um, of 1926. In, in Germany. Uh, and the birth rates in 1941 and 1942 actually fall below the 1926 date. So it's a, a complete failure. Now, um, there are questions on the census about religious affiliation, uh, ethnicity, and um, nationality. The problem is, of course, is um, for the Nazis is, is the question is, is framed in such a way is that those Jews who are no longer practicing Judaism uh, will not necessarily identify themselves as Jews on that census form, nor did in 1933 the Nazis yet introduce the 1935 Reich citizenship law that define the Jew as someone um, who has Jewish grandparents. So, so the question about um, what was um, the, the, the religion of your grandparents is never asked in the 1933 census, but it will be in uh, the next census, the 1939 census. So um, this data, is then uh, collected at, at, at this building here. You see, this is the Reich's Department of Statistics in, 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 in Berlin. Uh, here you have thousands of uh, clerks compiling um, population data, demographic data. Um, they work uh, at these key punch terminals <laughs> and um, and for those of you who might not have experienced this uh, prior to kind of digital uh, databases, um, we would use punch cards with, here's what they look like. Uh, in a punch card, there are all these different numbers in different columns. Um, a punch key operator will punch holes in these cards. And then these cards can be loaded up into uh, a electric, as opposed to electronic, electric uh, computer system developed by Deutsche Hollerith Machine and Company, which is, uh, here's their um, advertisement. Uh, the text reads, oversee everything with Hollerith punch cards. They're loaded up, um, and the Hollerith Company, by the way, is a subsidiary, is, is a, a German subsidiary of IBM uh, in, in Germany. Thus, that 
the gain accusation that IBM participated in the Holocaust. Yes, it did um, in the form of its subsidiary company in, 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 in Germany. And so these cards are then loaded up into this kind of um, electric sorting computer. You can program, you know, um, spit out all the cards of Jews living in a particular neighborhood. And if it's coded into the punch cards, um, this machine will, will sort those cards out. So again, if you if 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 you look at um, the kind of guides up there, uh, you can see how these various categories here. Category twenty two was religion. Uh, here you can see evangelical Protestant. Um, I'm not quite sure evangelical Lutheran, uh, Catholic. Um, I guess maybe Eastern Catholic, and then Jewish. Uh, one, two, three, and then your nationality, right? Polish, um, the mother language category entered and so forth. So all these things would have been entered into this kind of card. And here again, you can see Rasen Amt, race department of the SS. So these punch cards um, are essential, of course, in sorting uh, census data. So um, despite the fact that, like governments today, uh, Germany and the Nazis assured their citizens that census data will remain confidential, um, it's, it, it is remaining confidential within the SS department. Um, you know, it's, it's why certain religions still to this day refuse to participate in, in, in censuses just on religious grounds. Um, you know, uh, it's one thing you have an, a, a nice government and you believe them, you do your census as required by, by law as a good citizen, and, and then the government changes. Um, and, and as it did in Nazi Germany, and suddenly all that census data is going to be used to kill you. So um, when Hitler does the second census, um, the question on that census will be, um, you know, what religion were your grandparents? And, and so that will start identifying those Germans who have, um, don't feel themselves to be particularly Jewish as, as Jews under the citizenship law. So that's one thing. Um, I've already talked to you, of course, about Arbeid's book, uh, that every German has to carry an Arbeid's book. And, and, and so again, at the request of the Swiss, German passports are stamped with a big J and uh, the Nazis then decide, hey, this is a great idea. Um, the Swiss gave us a great idea. Let's stamp everything with um, a J. So all Jewish identification will be stamped with that uh, J. Um, you also have a system of um, registration in Nazi Germany as well. Um, Beginning in 1875, German registry officers um, record every change of uh, religious status. Uh, and, and so the Nazis pull all the registry books going back to those you know, 60 years to see who um, had grandparents or par parents who might have changed their religion from uh, Jewish to to either Catholic or Protestant, that would have been entry into the registry. Uh, teams of volunteers are sent out into country parishes and they start digging up old church records, baptismal records, um, going back 130 years. They alphabetize them and, and they uh, church volunteers. For example, the Evangelical Archives of Berlin uh, gather up all the church baptismal records and alphabetize those who were former Jews 
who were baptized into Christianity to identify their descendants. They form what's called the non-Germanic family baptismal registry. Librarians are given the assignment to go through literature and footnotes and PhD dissertations to identify intellectuals of Jewish origin and their families. So, um, 1939, the Reich's Office of Statistics uh, will hold the second census, and now uh, in 39, that census sends out 750,000 uh, census takers. And, and um, again, people, are, as I said, are asked about their, their grandparents, which is what, you know, is going to put you in a, a definition of, um, you know, whether you're Jewish or not. Um, there's also the Reich's registration order of January 6th, 1938. Um, all German heads of households have to register everybody living in their household um, and report that to a local police precinct who's living in your household. Uh, that, of course, is typical of, of, of Europe. Um, unlike Canada or the United States, um, Europe to this day has a kind of a very strict residence uh, system. You, you have an official residence. It's, um, you know, Europeans carry identity papers. It's, it's for example, it's an offense, a finable offense if a, a cop um, say in Italy or France stops you and asks you for your identification card and you're not carrying your national ID, um, that's an offense. You have to be able to present your identification um, and your official residence is, is fixed. Uh, unlike Ontario, you know, where we have kind of very loosey goosey re registration. Um, you, you know, um, I imagine that some of you uh, might still be registered from when you were in high school at your parents' address. You get your mail there, your OHIP is there, but your student residence or an apartment you might have rented just this year or the year before is not your official residence. Well, um, that's not the way it works in Europe. Um, and, and so for those of you who may have traveled in Europe, you may remember when you um, and I'm not talking about uh, Britain. Britain has a whole different um, values from continental Europe, but um, you might remember that whenever you check into a hotel in Europe, the first thing they do is they take your passport and usually they keep it uh, for the first night of your uh, arrival. You don't have your passport, they return it to you the next morning um, in France, for example. And that's because there is a special in Europe passport police that will visit every hotel uh, that night and, and, and go through the passports that were turned in that night for registry and register those people. Um, I know when I lived in, in Italy, um, if I had friends coming to stay with me rather than at a hotel, um, I would have to uh, take them to the Questura, which is a, a kind of, again, a police precinct, and, and register them. Otherwise, it, 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 it's a crime. Uh, when you get married, uh, you have to change your wife's official registration. It's in your marriage license. It's in your driving license. And, and I remember having these long discussions with the postman um, you know, when I did live in, 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 in Europe and um, I tried to explain to him that in Canada, we don't really have an official residence. Um, and, and, and the first thing the postman uh, says to me is, oh, you know, well, how do they know where to find you? Uh, well, that's the point, right? Uh, that's the point of kind of our Anglo-Saxon British uh, tradition of liberty and, and 
um, a privacy that has carried over into North America and certainly to the British uh, former um, colonies. In Europe, it's automatic. You, you got to be registered. So um, the Reich's registration uh, system, of course, immediately means that the police can look up a registry and very quickly get someone's address. And they already have all this other an ancillary uh, data, like a labor book and, 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 and so forth. And then the Nazis add another level of registration. In February 1939, the so-called uh, People's Registry, the Volkskartei. And you're looking at the Volkskartei form that every German is required uh, between the ages of 16 and 70 to fill out. Um, it's separated into male and female and then filed by date of birth in alphabetical order. Um, the nominal purpose of the Volkskartei is for military conscription purposes. So that's why it's filed by date of birth and why it's filed separately male and, and, and females. Um, you can see a row of numbers running across the, the, the top. Um, tabs would be attached to those numbers with a hole punched uh, through them and the tabs would have different colors and and so a specific color coded tab at a certain number would carry information about the card uh, who you know who is listed on that uh, card for example um, a yellow tab over the number four could mean that the person is uh, Jewish or um, a yellow tab over number five could mean that the person um, is Jewish but also has a driver's license or has a radio at home. All that information is compiled on, on, on that card. Um, these cards are then stored in under the desks of local Gestapo officers uh, with the tabs kind of protruding out of the drawer. And, and, and so um, if a Gestapo officer, for example, wants to know where all um, the Jews in his neighborhood are or how many they are, he takes a long wire, like a coat hanger wire, um, and he puts it through the hole in the tabs, say through the number four yellow tabs, and then he gently pulls on the wire and, and then all the cards uh, of, of the Jews in his neighborhood now come up. So it's, it's a way of, um, again, uh, identifying kind of almost like you would on a, on a computer, on a, a computer today, you kind of do a, a database sort. This is a way of kind of mechanically, physically sorting database in, in, in information. So um, everyone is required to do this in February. Uh, for children, um, the school teachers will fill out that form for pupils in, 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 in school. And when you submit the form, you're given a receipt. Without that receipt in the future, you are unable to get a driver's license, a ration card, marriage license. You can get no further identification uh, from the government unless you can produce the 1939 Volkskartei uh, registry. So essentially every single German between the ages of 16 and 70, starting 1939, is not only registered in this card, but their identity, their, like I say, their military, uh, essentially the cards were intended for identification of suitable recru recruits for the military, who can drive, who can, um, who has higher education and, and, and so forth, um, and, and, and again, by, by birth date, uh, but it also, of course, immediately registers and identifies people of Jewish uh, descent.
identification papers. Um, again, I, I, I spoke about um, the stamping of, of the J and, and after that, of course, all Jewish identification, whether they're um, passports, driver's licenses, ration cards, marriage licenses will be stamped with that J. This starts, um, all Jews must have that kind of um, identification by December 31st of 1938. Um, laws also state uh, that Jews have to identify themselves as Jews, whether they're asked or not, whenever presenting themselves to any official of the German government, whether it's a police officer or a postal clerk. Um, if, if you're Jewish, when you address them, you have to tell them I'm a Jew uh, before you can continue in any kind of um, interaction. So you have to self-identify. And um, as well, nomenclature. Um, as of August of 1938, uh, the Interior Ministry now issues a decree that all Jews now have to add a middle name to their names. Um, all male Jews have to add the name Israel to their name, and it has to be entered into their identification paper. And all females um, have to uh, enter the name Sarah into their identification. So uh, just by looking at a name, uh, Jews will be self-identifying themselves. Even if their um, card is not stamped with a J, just by the fact that they um, have to use the middle name Israel and the middle name Sarah will also identify them. Um, Jews are also prohibited from naming their uh, children after 1938 um, by Old Testament names that had become traditional in uh, Christianity, such as, for example, Adam, Daniel, David, Michael, um, Anna, Deborah, Esther, Ava, Ruth. Um, they, Jews can no longer use, name their children under these names. Um, the uh, Nazis invent new names for Jewish infants to use. For males, um, they have to name their child with uh, a name that always begins with the letter F. Uh, the names on the list are Phaleg, Feibish, Faisal, uh, Feithelm, Feiwell. Uh, for females, the name has to begin with the letter S. Sharna, uh, Schneidel, Shana, Sheva, uh, sh um, Shlameke, uh, Semke, sh Slowe, and uh, Spritzi become names that the Nazis invent for Jewish female infants. So all these new names um, have to be uh, recorded in the birth and marriage certificates along with the, mi the middle name Sarah or Israel, depending upon the gender of, 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 of the child. So nomenclature is the second process. And then um, the physical marking of Jews. This is something that Hitler constantly was opposed to. Um, Hitler was opposed to physically marking Jews because he felt that uh, people would attack Jews in the street, there would be mobs and, and, and so forth, and that this was not very productive. Again, I've talked about this a number of times, um, Hitler's notion of kind of cold scientific anti-Semitism, um, and, and, and certainly as Hitler was correct that um, the electoral process was the most uh, practical way uh, to power the, the constitutional uh, way 
um, he was also correct in his assessment that he will kill the most Jews using kind of cold scientific legal methods, um, legal under German law that of the time, as opposed to international law, um, in, in killing the most possible rather than kind of spontaneous, uncontrollable, um, embarrassing acts of mob violence or uh, pogroms as the way they have been happening throughout history. And, and, and that, of course, the kind of legality of the German system and the, how they uh, kind of very slowly developed all these laws and measures prior to implementing the final solution is, is what makes the Holocaust so uniquely different than, say, the genocide of the um, Armenians uh, by the Turks uh, during the First World War or the genocides in Rwanda or Cambodia or, or, or in the uh, Sudan, this, this, this kind of, again, cold scientific um, bureaucratic process in, involving laws and regulations and, and time is, is, is what makes um, the Holocaust a kind of unique proprietary um, event for, for Jews. We really haven't seen anything like it, thank God, since, since then, although we've had, you know, um, often we had other cases of genocide. The Holocaust is not the last act, but this kind of bureaucratic process is, is certainly unique. Um, 1938, Heydrich, in a meeting, um, was, was begging Hitler to introduce some way of um, marking Jews. And, and Goering, remember Goering had this fetish for uniform, um, Goering right away uh, proposes that he'll design a uniform for Jews. Uh, and, and, and the Heydrich immediately he says, no, 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 not a uniform, uh, some kind of insignia only. Uh, Hitler rejects this um, notion. And, and Hitler is nagged throughout 1939, 1940, into 1941 by the German bureaucracy to introduce identification, physical identification of, of, of Jews. Um, and, and Hilberg, in his destruction of the European Jews, will write, he says, it is characteristics of the development of the destruction process that in spite of the veto by the highest authority of the Reich, recurrent suggestions for introducing the measure in Germany were circulated in the ministerial offices of the hierarchy. So even with Hitler saying no, bureaucrats on um, the kind of ministerial level are constantly circulating memos that we should do this. Um, we see in Poland, of course, under uh, Hans Frank, in those uh, territory of the government general, already in 39, uh, Jews are required to wear an armband with the Star of David identifying them. Poles are, are marked, but it's not until um, August 20th that finally Hitler is persuaded, as now the war in Russia is, is, is um, well underway, that Hitler is finally persuaded to introduce this decree in uh, Germany and in other regions where there are Jews under German occupation. So the decree of September 1st, 1941 requires from September 19th that all Jews six years of age and over who appear in public are to wear a palm-sized yellow star with the word Jews woven into it, sewn tightly on the left front of their clothing, as this Jewish wedding party, you can see, has it. It's a felony to go into public 
without this star. Um, it's a felony to carry bags, for example, your groceries in a way that maybe covers this star or um, to position your arm as, as the woman on the right might have been. Um, there might be a star underneath her arm there. That would be a crime for her uh, to do that. This is a big shock, for example, for churches, um, as, as suddenly, for example, churches find after September 19th, some of their parishioners who are legally Jews, even though they're practicing Catholics and Protestants, um, suddenly they appear wearing a Jewish star at, at church, and uh, people suddenly realize that under the law, they're, they're Jews. Uh, the Catholic and Protestant churches officially will treat this in different ways. Um, the Catholic church, if parishioners object to having Jews among them, or, or Jewish Catholics, as, as, as they would be, I guess, among them, uh, the Catholic church office offers to hold separate services for those Catholics who are under the law considered to be Jews and are now wearing a, a, a Jewish star. The Protestant church, uh, Protestant churches as a policy, again, individual Protestant ministers may have reacted in different ways, but essentially Protestant churches as an organization uh, now refuse to um, accept pro Jewish Protestants among their uh, per per uh, parishioners. They're, they're, they're rejected. The requirement is to wear that star um, in a public space. So, for example, um, German corporations that had Jewish employees working in them uh, didn't like this idea of their employees now wearing these yellow stars. And, and, and so, for example, the Siemens Corporation, still in business today, uh, asked the RSHA for clarification whether a factory um, is a public space or, 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 or not. Um, and, and also stated that already uh, Jewish and German workers are segregated in the Siemens factory without having marked their factory workers. Unfortunately, we don't have on the historical record what the response to that query um, was. And uh, the final kind of a physical marking of, 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 of the Jews, uh, April 1942, uh, Jews are required to paste uh, a Star of David on the doors of their residence. And, and that essentially completes the cycle um, as the final solution by then was already lurching forward. So um, Jewish residences, although as, as I say, the deportations had already begun way back in uh, September, October of 1941, same time as the Star Decree is introduced uh, by April of 42, houses are being uh, marked as, as, as well. A lot changes for German Jews on September 1st, 1939, when the war begins. Um, the war state radicalizes uh, German anti-Jewish policy. Uh, so once the war is declared, immediately there's a curfew on all Jewish citizens. Uh, the curfew is 8 p.m. in the winter, 9 p.m. in the summer. 
Um, food rationing is introduced in uh, Germany August 28 for 19, uh, 1939 on the eve of the war. Um, and of course, a rationing is more severe for Jews than for non-Jews in, in Germany. Uh, Jews get a special ration card, as I say, stamped with a J. They receive less rations, some things they don't get at all. Uh, for example, they don't get uh, cocoa, they don't get uh, rice, um, they get less meat and less butter, and then eventually no meat, no butter. By January 1940, Jews were not allowed to have um, any vegetables, meat, um, or fruit. And I don't know what that leaves. Um, I guess it leaves grain is about the only thing you're, 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 you're left to eat. So by January 9, 1940, no vegetables, no meat, no of, of fruit. Um, Jews who are, Jews are also required to do labor for less pay and no benefits and a higher uh, tax rate as well. So uh, Jews doing heavy labor get 200 grams of meat a week. Um, for those of you um, who might have, um, you know, uh, bought sliced meat, uh, 200 grams of sliced meat, you, you, you know that that's about good for three sandwiches, maybe. That's a week. Uh, Germans get 1,000 grams a week. Um, Jews as well are restricted um, to shopping only one hour per day. Uh, and you got to remember that in those days, you had no supermarkets uh, where you can get all your shopping done. You uh, uh, German Jews had one hour to go to the butcher, the baker, the um, uh, grocer, the fruit dealer, you know, uh, all the store, the, the, the uh, dairy, um, all the stores were different. There were no supermarkets and, and you only had a week. And usually it was the most inconvenient hour when most Jews were doing their, their um, compulsory labor. So, for example, um, for Jews, the shopping hour in Berlin was 4 to 5 p.m. And, and most Jews were at work. They could not show up to do their shopping. Uh, moreover, um, if an Aryan arrived in that hour, they would go to the beginning of the line. Uh, moreover, by 4 p.m., often whatever the daily ration that was available would have been already sold out. So uh, many Jews arrive at, at stores hoping to buy food under their, their ration card, and the food is gone. Um, some Jews that had a relationship with their um, grocer, the, you know, some grocery stores would hide food for their um, friends, their Jewish friends or their regular customers. They would hide that food for them under the counter. Um, so, uh, you know, a warning to all of you as, as, as um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, might be facing food shortages in the future if, if this COVID thing comes back with a vengeance. Um, in the winter, uh, make nice with your local grocer. If we ever get into rationing, um, it's good to have friends behind behind the counter, and and that really is the difference between why how some survived or didn't survive. Why by virtue of um, German merchants willing to hide extra rations for um, for for Jews. So that's about it for a rationing. Um, Jews, of course, are prohibited by 1940 from buying any canned goods, fish, poultry, tobacco, ersatz coffee. Ersatz coffee is fake coffee. There's a shortage of coffee in Germany, like real coffee. Um, milk, milk products. Jewish children are prohibited from buying candy. 
um, buying on the black market is not a solution because Jewish homes are subject to routine searches by the Gestapo. And if the Gestapo finds any black market food in a Jewish household, the food is confiscated and um, the household is fined for having black market goods. Rao Hilberg describes a famous case um, of real coffee arriving in Berlin in 1941. Um, since the Germans never had real coffee since the war began, uh, real coffee was not on the list of uh, food items prohibited uh, to Jews. And so um, 500 Jews in Berlin, sorry, I, I just have to push the door shut as a big garbage truck is arriving outside my balcony here. So Rao Hilbert describes this famous case of um, Berlin's so-called coffee Jews. Uh, and that also, this case tells us a lot about just how the German legal system is still resisting Nazi um, German common law, as the Nazis will describe it, as late as 1941. Um, 500 Jews in Berlin register for a ration of coffee since um, Erzatz coffee is prohibited, but um, real coffee is not on the list of prohibited um, food items for, for Jews. Um, the food office strikes the Jews off the list and, and actually um, asks the police to fine them for distributing, uh, for disturbing the peace. Um, these Berlin Jews now launch a class action suit against the food office in Berlin. This is 1941. This is as Jews are already being deported from, from, from Germany. Um, the food office argues in court that, quote, the Jews should have known, end of quote, that they're not eligible for coffee, even if it's not written in the regulations, that it should have been obvious to the Jews that they're not eligible for real coffee. Uh, but the court upholds the class action suit, ruling that the food office cannot act in an arbitrary manner on the basis of an artificial interpretation of the law and orders the food office to distribute the coffee um, to these Jews. And, and so uh, the newly appointed justice minister, Thirak, sets the Berlin court straight. Hitler is really angry and, and Hitler will um, order Bormann, who's like the Supreme Court justice of all judges to overturn this uh, decision. But uh, Justice Minister Thirak says, you know, the decision of the local court borders in form and content on deliberate embarrassment of a German administrative body vis-a-vis -vis the Jews. The judge should have asked himself with what satisfaction the Jew received the decision of this court, which certified him and his 500 racial comrades in a 20-page argument, his right and his victory over a German office, not to speak of the reaction of the people's sound instinct to this impertinence and presumptuous behavior of the Jews. So that a German court as late as, um, you know, autumn of 1941 would still rule in favor of a Jewish class action lawsuit is, is, is again, remarkable how long there is kind of still um, in the ministerial, judicial, bureaucratic level resistance to Hitler's uh, policies. Um, and so Rao Hilberg notes, he says, the 500 Jews who, quote, won um, the case were immediately deported to a killing center. Um, he writes, quote, no more coffee for these Jews, end of quote. 
So by 1940, Jews are prohibited from buying clothing, shoes, or underwear. They're prohibited from buying materials from which to make or repair clothing or shoes. Public laundries are off limits to German Jews. Um, only designated Jewish shoemakers are allowed to repair uh, shoes for, for, for Jews. On five days notice, Jews are required to leave their apartment and home to designated Jewish uh, residences. Um, these are not exactly sealed ghettos, but, but they are ghetto-like, um, and they're increasingly overcrowded in, in squalid housing. Jews are prohibited from entering forests or park, from owning cars, silverware, radios, or cameras. Um, they're, of course, prohibited from owning pets, as, as, as you saw from, again, my first lecture on, on, on German animal rights laws. Uh, Jews are required to do um, hard manual labor at the lowest wages and highest taxes, no benefits, no health insurance, no maternity leave. Um, and again, October 1941, the deportations of Jews from Germany begin. They start being deported to ghettos in Poland and, and as months go by later, directly into death camps. Um, of Berlin, there's 73,000 Jews in Berlin, only 6,000 remain by 1944. Um, and I, I suspect those 6,000 um, are, are among them are Mischlinger of the second degree, who are not subject to deportation. So it's estimated that oh, of about you know, if we include all the Jews that from Austria, we're talking about approximately, um, and Czechoslovakia, uh, uh, the Sudetenland, we're talking about approximately 330,000 Jews in 1939, um, approximately 10 to 12,000 Jews just go into hiding and refuse to show up at these deportations. Um, and, and, the survival will be will depend on luck. Uh, some Jews prepare hiding places, you know, the way the Anne Frank family did in uh, the Netherlands. Um, and of course, some of these hiding places are uh, revealed by neighbors, by informants. Um, for some Jews, the bombing. The Allied bombing helps. Um, for some, it hurts. For some uh, Jews, they live their, lose their hiding places when they get bombed out. But um, when the bombing begins, some Jews um, just end up sleeping in railway stations or on a streetcar, uh, claiming that they're Germans and that they lost their um, identification in the bombing. So in some sense, bombings help. Um, it's easier for a woman to survive than a man, especially a young man, uh, because the issue for police is, you know, if you have a young man of military age, why aren't you serving in the German army? Uh, let's see your identification and, and, and so forth, um, where um, a female might slip by. It's easier, of course, if, if, if um, you kind of have Germanic features, your, um, you know, your hair is light colored, your blue why, um, again, um, females often find shelter in German homes. They're hired as a housekeeper or as a nanny. Sometimes, um, you know, good help is hard to find. And, and so some German households or, or, or um, farming communities, they, they know that the person is, is uh, Jewish or they suspect it, but they need a labor the way, you know, middle class Americans hire um, illegal Mexican immigrants to work as, um, uh, you know, household servants or nannies or housekeepers, knowing that they're illegal. Um, uh, German households are doing the same way. Um, some just, you know, one woman and her daughters, she just begins to walk Germany in circles for three years um, every night, knocking on the farmer's door. 
and uh, stating that she's on her way home with her family uh, to rejoin her family, that she and her children were bombed out in her house in Berlin, and will the farmer give her a couple of eggs and let her sleep in the barn uh, that night with her children? Um, most farmers, of course, take pity and say yes, and she very carefully marks on the map where she slept the night so she doesn't accidentally um, circle back and, and, and um, you know, show up at the same farm a year and a half uh, later. So um, that's how she survives. So uh, through all sorts of extraordinary uh, means, some Jews manage um, uh, to survive. Um, I've already said that most young men have already left Germany um, long before the war started. So again, um, most of the population is elderly, um, predominantly um, female, but again, for any males of military age, survival uh, becomes virtually impossible simply because even if they were German, the question is asked is, why aren't you serving in um, uh, the military? Um, most of the Jews that are caught are essentially caught by uh, neighbors denouncing them. Uh, and in some countries, uh, like, for example, Holland, uh, rewards are paid if you find the Jew. And, and, and so um, the Dutch, uh, for some reason, are particularly notorious um, for inspiring this whole uh, breed of uh, Jewish bounty hunters um, who uh, were just seeking out Jews, uh, as I say, on, on their own, looking for Jews that they can uh, turn in for, for the bounty. So, as I say, out of Berlin's um, roughly, you know, 70, 75,000 uh, uh, Jews, only 6,000 will still be um, alive by 1944. So, a great majority of, 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 of German Jews will die. Um, the great majority of German Jews who did not show up to deportations will also uh, die. Um, it's, a, it's a very small minority who um, kind of rebel and, and, and risk uh, kind of higher punishment and, 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 and end up surviving by virtue of that. Um, the problem for everybody is essentially, when do I become an outlaw? Um, uh, you know, again, um, hopefully none of you will be faced with that kind of situation, but the tendency of a populace as the state becomes more repressive um, and div divisive as various members of your community become targeted but not you, um, the question becomes, do I go into the opposition now or do I wait until they turn on me and, and then um, can it get any worse? And, and the tendency for most people is to say, well, this today is as bad as it's going to get. It's not going to get any worse. Um, and, 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 and so people stall um, taking these risky measures until it's too late. And, and then the risk is, you know, later the risk is overwhelmingly the odds, be, you know, go, go against you. So, again, uh, those are... Um, you know, the lessons you can take from certainly the Jewish experience um, in, 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 in the Holocaust is, um, you know, be prepared. Um, a lot of Jews as well, especially wealthy Jews or middle class Jews, you know, um, what do I do with my furniture? What do I do with my art collection? What do I do with my books? What do I do with my silverware? I can't leave all this stuff behind. Um, and this is something we're also susceptible to this, you know. Um, do I leave all my junk, my furniture, my art, my electronics, all my stuff that I can take with me when I go into hiding? Uh, what do I do with my apartment? With So a lot of people just remain there clutching to their furniture, their paintings, their property um, until the Nazis came to their door, took it from them and put them in a death camp. Um, and, and that was up. People died 
uh, for their furniture, essentially. While again, younger, um, maybe less wealthy um, Jews just hit the road because they had very little to lose kind of in their daily, ordinary, conventional life. And by virtue of that, by um, traveling light, essentially, living light, essentially, was the key to their survival. 